It has been our great honor to have Professor Hui Min Zhao to give this uh, distinguished IS lecture. And uh, this year is especially, you know, let's say special because uh, actually Hui Min Zhao, Professor Hui Min Zhao just came back from the Nobel Prize ceremony in Stockholm. And uh, apparently his PhD thesis played a key role in this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry, you know, the last week I think I gave a Nobel Law, Popular Science lecture here, so it's about uh, directed evolution. So his talk today is also about directed evolution. Uh, Professor Hui Min Zhao himself is also very renowned and uh, successful researcher. Uh, uh, you know, he's one of the finest bioengineers of our time. Uh, so I think I have prepared this, actually. So. Yeah, uh, let, let me say something about uh, Professor Hui Min Zhao's past, okay? Uh, he got a bachelor degree from University of Science and Technology, China, U USTC. And uh, then he moved on to US for PhD uh, at Caltech, okay, the, the finest universities on this planet, okay? And uh, uh, under supervision of <laughs> Francis and Arnold. I think I offended some of <laughs> the audience. Anyway, uh, and then b before he joined the UIUC as a faculty member in 2000, he was a project leader, worked for a Dow Chemical Company, one of the leading uh, chemical company worldwide, okay? And uh, he was promoted to full professor in 2008 at UIUC. He has co-authored authored and co-authored over 290 research papers and uh, issued over 220 patents, okay? And uh, also, this is the most important thing, 22 of his former graduate students and postdoc eventually become professors. Many end up uh, a faculty position in US, eight of them, and uh, 10 of them now are professors in China. Okay, and uh, some, the rest are, you know, spattered world, worldwide, around the globe. So, <laughs> Professor Zhao received numerous research and teaching awards and honors. Uh, to name a few, he is one of the uh, he was elected uh, as a fellow of American Institute uh, of Medical and Biological Engineering. And he also was elected uh, as a fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2010. All right, also, this is important because we have a lot of students who are interested in entrepreneurship and uh, biotechnologies. So Professor Zhao served as a consultant for over 10 companies, many of our, which are leading players in biotechnology, such as Pfizer, BP, Givo, okay? Uh, all right, so to save the time, I'll just give the floor to Professor Zhao. Please join me to welcome Professor Zhao. Thanks for your nice introduction. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here. Actually, I've been to Hong Kong many times, but always in the airport. So this actually is the first time I landed in the real Hong Kong. You know? um, and yesterday I gave a talk in the uh, Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong, and, uh, and now actually I'm here. So it's a really great pleasure. I have uh, many friends uh, here, actually, uh, some actually in the audience, right? So I should actually be here a long time ago, actually. Uh, and this is a talk, actually, I kind of uh, was kind of requested by uh, Fei, you know, because um, I haven't talked about uh, direct evolution for a long time. You know, it, in when I started uh, my independent career almost 20 years ago, in the first 10 years, I talked about a lot about direct evolution, tried to promote it. And, and then in the recent years, actually, uh, my work is mostly focused on synthetic biology. But still, you know, in my lab, we use uh, direct evolution very widely as a you know, powerful tool for engineering of uh, biological systems, including proteins, pathways, and uh, genomes. So that's why today, actually, I want to really talk about uh, our effort uh, in the biosystem design area. 
And as uh, uh, Faye just mentioned, and I think uh, this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given to three you know, researchers, right? And my former advisor, Francis, actually got Nobel Prize for the direct evolution of uh, enzymes. Uh, actually, coincidentally, uh, my thesis title was called uh, uh, Enzyme Engineering by Direct Evolution. <laughs> so I was really the first graduate student to work in her lab on direct evolution. Of course, before that, of course, uh, she had the students work on other areas. But anyway, I think you know, uh, we've, uh, I recognized the importance of the revolution, of course, uh, many uh, years ago. You know, <clears throat> and because if you look at uh, the current biotech industry, right, it is, uh, uh, or in the biological science, actually, they are kind of driven by you know, those uh, uh, important technologies, right, such as uh, you know, recombinant DNA technology, which was invented in 1973 and the DNA sequencing technology. Now we all use that very widely. Monoclonal antibody, side direct amino genesis, PCR, right? And uh, you know, direct evolution uh, was uh, invented in the early you know, 90s. And then more recently, of course, you know, genome editing or iPS cell lines, right? And indeed, most of the inventors for those technologies all got a Nobel Prize, right? That's not a surprise, because they really kind of you know, are transformative uh, technologies that uh, enable us to uh, uh, study the biological system uh, much more efficiently and uh, quickly. And of course, biotechnology was initially applied to the um, medical area, and that is considered the first wave of biotechnology, or in Europe, it's called uh, red biotechnology. And in the 90s, biotechnology was applied to agriculture uh, industry, that is considered as the second wave. And then uh, in 2000s, uh, biotech was uh, applied to the industrial uh, uh, sector, mainly those like uh, chemical companies and uh, uh, you know energy companies, and of course uh, you know um, in order to make the uh, biotech really a reality, we also have to really uh, uh, consider the uh, downstream process as well. How you actually can purify the products, you know, very quickly. So you have to design better reactors, uh, come up uh, better process, and I think uh, chemical engineers actually can play a very important role in that area. And so direct evolution actually is a very simple concept, and all, you know, but yet it's very powerful, I would argue. So it's really, it's just mimic the Darwinian evolution process in the test tube, right? So which consists of uh, iterative cycles of uh, diversity generation followed by screening and selection. And of course, initially, uh, direct evolution was applied to protein, but then later also applied to pathways or whole genomes. And eventually, you can also even the ecosystem as well. A microbial ecosystem. And for uh, direct evolution, of course, uh, we can use it to improve almost all kinds of protein functions, such as activity, stability, uh, or even you know, uh, uh, create uh, new reactivities as well. And indeed, actually, it is a, a, a broadly applicable uh, approach. Uh, you can use that approach to engineer proteins for you know, various applications, right? Like the enzyme catalyst, uh, developing enzyme catalyst or crop protection proteins, uh, and also you know, engineer uh, antibodies. Um, so I think uh, uh, one of the uh, inventors, uh, in one of the Nobel Prize winner this year, Craig Venter, actually, uh, Winter managed actually for the work on antibody engineering, right? And then uh, the reference also can be used for pathway engineering. Uh, to produce uh, chemicals of polymers uh, or you know, uh, natural products or nutraceuticals. And also, we can use direct evolution to engineer microorganisms, right? Not just organisms, but any organism for various applications as well. So it indeed has a you know, very broad range of applications. And then if you look at the, the, uh, the, the key developments in this field, and this actually is a, a, a review article I wrote you know, many years ago, a few year, uh, five years ago, right? So basically, actually, the first uh, uh, concept actually was demonstrated in the uh, uh, 60s, which was uh, actually uh, demonstrated by uh, uh, a professor at the University of Illinois, actually, uh, you know, in 1967. So he showed that you can evolve RNA molecules in the test tube very quickly. And then, of course, uh, you know, um, as you all know, uh, in 1985, I think uh, uh, George Smith actually developed the, the phage display method, and he also got Nobel Prize this year. And then, you know, the direct evolution approach. So, in this review article, I already kind of predict the two Nobel <laughs> laureates, you know, for this year. These are really played a very important role, you know, in the development of this uh, direct evolution field, right? And then later, of course, you know, it's also. Uh, uh, 
uh, the, the direct commercial approach was uh, uh, applied uh, for engineering of uh, pathways as highlighted in you know, green. And then in recent years, it also uh, was used to engineer uh, microorganisms, or, or at least the whole genomes. So um, I actually developed uh, you know, this uh, uh, step method for gene recombination you know, when I was a graduate student. And then you know, after I studied my independent career, I also studied, developed this uh, uh, iterative uh, uh, saturation biogenesis method for um, uh, protein engineering. And I'll talk about a few more you know, methods that we developed uh, in over the past like, uh, you know, 18 years uh, for uh, direct evolution. So my lab actually, as I mentioned, really is now focused on synthetic biology. So we are mainly actually interested in developing you know, uh, tools, right? And that is a kind of a, a core mission in my lab. I'm always fascinated by developing new tools. And, uh, uh, so we try to develop uh, you know, the, uh, uh, an integrated robotic system we call the you know, biofoundry, right? or the Illinois Biological Foundry for Advanced Biomanufacturing. So in this foundry, actually, we integrate a lot of instruments, and I will show you that uh, uh, system in a minute, how we can use that system for biological engineering. But another area we're interested in is really interesting uh, is uh, uh, drug discovery and development. So we're very interested in developing synthetic biology tools to activate those silent gene clusters that are involved in the synthesis of uh, natural products. And those natural products, of course, as you know, are a major source of uh, antibiotics and anti-cancer drugs, right? So we actually developed uh, many tools to, you know, uh, uh, basically to uh, isolate those uh, novel uh, uh, natural products. You know? And some of them may have you know, important biological activities. And then another area we are interested in engineering uh, the microbial cell factories, particularly is uh, yeast, and also engineering uh, like E. coli as well for production of uh, a wide variety of uh, chemicals and uh, 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 you know, uh, anyway, small molecule based uh, uh, compounds. And we basically try to rewire all the metabolism you know, in the cell, but also we want to understand you know, um, what it really constrains the production of those small molecules uh, in the uh, microorganisms using various you know, uh, system biology tools. And then lastly, we're also interested in uh, the development of those uh, uh, genome editing tools for gene therapy, but also study like the chromatin structure and function. So I have uh, one, and I actually funded the project in which we actually try to develop a uh, you know, CRISPR-based approach to uh, basically uh, tag you know, a certain low size in the chromosome, uh, no, in the chromatin, and, uh, uh, and then really want to do the live cell imaging, right? And then of course, also we can use those tools really uh, for therapeutic applications as well. But today, actually, many talk about uh, you know, our efforts are focusing on direct evolution. As I mentioned, direct evolution is really is a powerful uh, tool, right? So we used that tool in many of the you know, uh, projects in my laboratory. So some of the projects actually I will talk about today were all done more than 10 years ago, but I just want to give you the historical account of this field. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, you know, when I was a graduate student, you know, I developed a few direct evolution techniques and then actually we used those tools to engineer enzymes as a catalyst. Then after I studied at the University of Illinois, I basically tried to further develop new direct evolution tools. Mainly actually is try to uh, create uh, you know, new uh, uh, functions in proteins. And uh, so one project that we worked on in my early years is really to engineer you know, those uh, 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 gene switch, essentially it's those artificial transcription factors, right? So we can use the small molecules to regulate the gene expression temporarily and especially in like mammalian cells. And of course, it has you know, many applications. Uh, many is related to uh, you know, medical applications, right? Particularly, we are interested in gene therapy because we want to control the dose you know, of the therapeutic proteins precisely. And so the construct of uh, the uh, gene switch actually is very simple. Essentially, you fuse the DNA binding domain with the ligand binding domain that will respond to the small molecule. And then also, you fuse it with the activation domain so that the, it can recruit the RNA uh, transcription machinery right, to uh, express the, the whatever the target gene in the downstream. 
And uh, uh, at that time, we actually used the DNA bind domain that actually can bind the, like the GAL4 binding site. But now, with the TELS or even CRISPRs, it actually offers the ability basically to target any region right, on the chromosome to activate the gene expression. So I think this actually could be, you know, I mean, revive that uh, uh, research <laughs> line in the future. You know. But at that time, we basically uh, wanted to know that whether we can really design uh, artificial, uh, artificial transcription factor that can respond to new chemicals, right, that are either not toxic, not toxic to mammalian cells, or in a very low toxicity, right? Because essentially those compounds could be used as drugs. And because we want to use that one to you know, turn on gene expression in mammalian cells or even in human uh, beings, right? So, and we used this ligand bind domain from the estrogen receptor. And if you look at, you know, it can respond to estradiol very well you know, at the you know, uh, sub-nanomolar kind of uh, you know, uh, affinity. And uh, it, it doesn't respond to our um, uh, inducer, you know, the, uh, uh, the new inducer very well you know, at the, like a micromolar range, right? So there's like almost a three order magnitude you know, difference in terms of uh, sensitivity. So at that time, we developed this uh, uh, so-called uh, targeted saturation metagenesis strategy. So essentially, we build a, a structural model uh, uh, and then dock this uh, uh, small molecule into the ligand binding pocket and then identify those residues uh, that interact with the small molecule. Because this is very simple. But we did this one you know, almost 20 years ago, right? So we did some you know, modeling work. And then we actually um, basically applied this uh, direct evolution approach and we uh, improved the, the, um, the sensitivity of the uh, ligand bind domain towards uh, the new you know, uh, ligand by like a 200 fold. But in the meantime, we also reduced the uh, response of the ligand bind domain to the native uh, uh, ligand by uh, almost a million fold, right? So basically, we wanted to create a um, artificial, uh, artificial transcription factor that only respond to our uh, design, uh, our new, you know, uh, uh, ligand, right? Not the older one, because otherwise, you know, it, it will interfere. The 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 the, the endogenous uh, estradiol will interfere the performance of the uh, gene switch. And then we actually continued, uh, you know, after we published that paper, we continued to uh, improve the sensitivity. Actually, we showed that we can completely switch the, this uh, to you know, uh, dose response curve, because now the mutant can respond to the um, synthetic ligand at the you know, sub-nanomolar uh, concentration and it barely show any response towards the estradiol, right? So that actually is uh, very, you know, I think, uh, 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 important. So if you do some calculation, actually you find that it only requires a few molecules to turn on the gene expression. And then we also apply the same approach to another compound, you know, as I shown here, this is uh, uh, more different from the estradiol structurally, and we also were able to create a mutant that now respond to nanomolar and a barely uh, no response almost uh, to the compound. Right? It's also achieved a very you know, big improvement. So now we basically created the three orthogonal ligand receptor pairs. Right? So as you can see, we use the different reporters, and they all work basically independently. Right? They don't have any like, interference. Right? So with this kind of system, now we can regulate uh, basically multiple gene expression in mammalian cells. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, we are more fascinated about uh, the creation of uh, new functions, not just you know, improve the existing function. Although we achieved the 10 to the 10th you know, kind of <laughs> improvement, but still, you know, it's not a new function, right? So we're very interested in uh, the question whether we can really create new protein functions. So at that time, I mean, this, of course, is very challenging, as you can imagine. You know, direct evolution works very well when you uh, use it to improve existing functions. You basically, you know, by accumulating those uh, beneficial mutations, you can dramatically improve the function. But uh, if you want to create new functions, it's uh, difficult, mainly because it may require simultaneous, many simultaneous mutations, right? That's very hard to do, because if you can do the simple you know, mathematics, you will find if you want to introduce a one mutation, right, to a typical protein of 300 amino acids, the library is about 6,000. If you want to introduce two mutations simultaneously, the library is already more than 10 million, right? 
And then if you want to introduce three mutations simultaneously, that number is just too big already for any like a screening method, right? Because if you look at uh, the existing uh, library creation method, uh, if you use the yeast display, you can get 10 to the seventh. Uh, bacteria, maybe 10 to the eighth. Phage, maybe 10 to the tenth. But it's still, you, know, so you can basically not exhaustive so, so find all the possible uh, combinations. So that's why you know that that was more than 10 years ago, or no, almost uh, yeah, uh, 15 years ago. So we basically thought uh, maybe we can actually uh, come up uh, 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 this in vitro co-evolution strategy. So the idea is that you know basically if you look at sequence space, you know Y type of function, uh, novel function, basically they are uh, at the separate locations. That's why you know uh, this is considered novel function, right? And uh, and in order to jump from the y type function to the null function, it may actually require uh, the introduction of uh, many you know, simultaneous mutations. And uh, so our idea is to basically introduce those intermediate you know, uh, functions that will bridge with each other, right? So then eventually we can reach to the uh, new function. So that's a very simple you know, uh, concept. Basically, we evolve uh, the substrate together with the protein, right? And that, of course, is done in nature already. But how we can do it you know, in the laboratory, right? So then we actually used this uh, uh, estrogen receptor uh, ligand bind domain as a, a kind of a proof of concept uh, study again. So if you look at the, the corticosterone, right, that's, uh, they are very, you know, they're still structurally related, but you know, it's very different because if you look at the dose response, you know, the ligand bind domain will respond to estrogen dial, but no activity towards this comment. So I consider that as a new function, right? Of course, this is not very rigorous, because if you have very, very sensitive assay, maybe that it still can respond. But at least, you know, experimentally, we can not really detect any response. And then we actually introduced uh, two more substrate, like testosterone and progesterone. And if you look at their structural difference, right? Here, they differ by here, this function, and, and these two positions. And, uh, uh, and then this one differed by here, you know, the, the progesterone at this position. And then also uh, these two, you know, differed by this, these two positions. And then if you look at the, the response, you know, only I think testosterone had some response. Progesterone, almost no response. And then testosterone, you no response, right? So that's how we define, you know, the corticosterone activity as the new function. And then what we did is that we applied the you know, direct evolution approach again. In this case, we only apply positive selection. We just want to see whether we can, you know, uh, reach uh, the... Uh, the new function or not. So we just introduced uh, 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 create a library and a screen in a not very big library, 10 to the fourth. And we found a, a few mutants in a, uh, uh, no, no, this is a wild type, right? It had some response. Uh, and then we actually found a mutant. Now it showed a you know, uh, more sensitive response towards testosterone. And, uh, and so of course, it still has a uh, you know, response towards uh, estradiol because we didn't try to you know, minimize the response towards uh, estradiol. And then also you show some response towards the progesterone, but no response towards the corticosterone. And then we did another round of uh, direct evolution, and we found uh, another mutant. Now they show the, you know, even more sensitive response to high response towards to testosterone. And this one, you just ignore it. We don't screen for it, right? And then here now we saw more you know, response towards the progesterone. And then here we still don't see any response, right? And then we switch to progesterone because now we see activity to progesterone, and then we switch to it. And then we actually uh, uh, found a, a mutant now has a, you know, increased the response towards uh, progesterone. And uh, then we actually did another round, you know, screened the, uh, almost a, a million. And we found that many actually showed a, you know, increased response. And here just two of them. And now they can actually show the response towards uh, cholesterol. So we basically gradually you know, um, evolved the protein along with the substrate to create this new reactivity, right? So that's actually is kind of the you know early work and you know, I did you know when I started the, my independent uh, career, and then we also actually wonder you know <clears throat> whether we can apply the direct evolution approach to engineer pathways right not just a single enzymes. So here I just want to show you an example in which actually we try to optimize uh, the pathway for the production of uh, 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 chemicals, and this actually turns out to be a very uh, it's a big challenge in metabolic engineering uh, because uh, you know. Uh, there's so many enzymes that they work together, right? You really need a balanced flux because otherwise you have accumulation of intermediates, and that's not good actually for the uh, yield, right? And also, the, some intermediate may be toxic to the cell. So then there are many you know, approaches being developed, 
but it, is, it remains to be challenging to simultaneously optimize uh, the pathway. So then we actually came up with uh, this uh, uh, approach called a uh, compact. So it's called a custom, uh, customized optimization of metabolic pathways by combinatorial transcription engineering. So once again, it's a very simple concept. So we basically you know, developed a, a, a DNA assembly method, right? And then actually we <clears throat> Uh, basically change the promoters with the different uh, strengths, right? So that we can tune you know, the expression level. And then we can you know, basically uh, create a library of those pathways with different combinations of those promoters with different uh, strengths. And then we actually uh, transform those uh, uh, plasmid containing those pathways into the cell and then do the you know, high throughput screening or selection. So once again, it's the direct evolution concept, right? And then we can actually find the, the one with you know, increased production. So in that case, we created a, you know, a, a library of those mutant with different uh, mutant promoters with different. Uh, uh, first of all, we choose the you know six promoters, uh, and then we actually create uh, mutations in those promoters to generate you know mutant with different uh, strengths, right? And we actually used uh, two uh, pathways as a, a kind of a proof of concept uh, study, and one actually is the um, Azalos utilization pathway, which consists of like three genes. And the other uh, pathway is, uh, is called a cellular biosutilization pathway, which consists of two genes. And what we did is that uh, we just used the you know, compact method I just mentioned to create a library of uh, xylosutilization pathways and then transform them into a laboratory strain, you know, uh, this uh, Easter strain. And then we just screen uh, the, tri uh, the library to identify the one that grow faster, right, in the presence of uh, Azalos. So it's a very simple readout. So then indeed, we were able to find a few, you know, show the you know, much higher you know, uh, Azalos utilization uh, uh, rate, and also uh, have an increased uh, ethanol production as well. And then we also transformed the same library into the industrial strain, because they have a different genetic background. And in that case, we also found a you know, significant improvement. Actually, they improved even more significant than the laboratory strain. Right? And then we, for the second enzyme uh, pathway, we did the same thing, and we can also improve it as well. And as summarized in this table, you know, we actually basically through a few rounds of uh, direct evolution, we can actually increase the cell bios uh, consumption rate by tenfold, right? And also, you know, increase the ethanol production by almost tenfold, right? So, but once again, those are you know still concept uh, uh, proof of concept studies because uh, these numbers are still not high enough for practical applications. But I want to actually spend more time. And, and talk about our recent work, because all this work was done more, more than 10 years ago, right? So I'm more talk about our recent work, how actually we really can use direct evolution approach to engineer whole organism, right? Particularly, you know, uh, perform genome scale engineering. So my vision is really is try to develop uh, an automated cellular engineering platform. And so in this platform, we basically want to use genome-wide editing modules, either based on talents, CRISPRs, or in a, a small uh, regular RNA, or in a RNA interference, right? And I use those tools to so basically can perturb the gene expression of all the, uh, the expression of all the genes in the cell. And then we want to use high throughput screening or selection method to identify those improved uh, you know, uh, uh, mutants. And then we want to integrate those uh, you know, beneficial editing modules into the chromosome so that we can repeat this cycle, right? And I think the idea is really try to make it a uh, whole process automated. And also we want to make it uh, very versatile and you know, uh, flexible uh, so that we can work on different organisms. So in order to do that, we actually developed uh, this uh, biofoundry I just mentioned in the beginning, right? So what we did is that we basically integrate uh, more than like 20 instrumentations, right, in a large platform as I shown here. You know, you have the liquid handling system, you know, PCR machines, and incubators with different temperatures, and also plate readers, uh, you know, centrifuges, you know, basically the, a lot of equipment you use in the laboratory. But then we actually um, want to use this uh, uh, system for various, you know, biotech uh, applications, uh, such as, you know, protein engineering, pathway engineering, genome engineering, or library screening, or genome typing, right? And of course, those workflows are very different. So our idea is to basically break those uh, workflows into process modules, which will be in turn broken down into unit operations. And those unit operations are more like a uh, universal. So then we can basically program you know, those uh, unit operations to create a custom designed workflow for your target system. 
and also we developed the, you know, the kind of the software, like the BioCAD, right? Basically can design all the uh, uh, pass, pass me the, all the, the, the manipulations, actually genetic manipulations uh, on the computer, and uh, which, which uh, will interface with the operating system that can control you know, this robotic system. So in the center of the robotic system, there's a basically a robotic arm, right? that actually has a six degree of movement. It basically, it's a replace uh, human research, as you can imagine. But the, uh, the, the advantage is that you, know, you can run it for 24 hours, so seven days a week, right? <laughs> if it works very well, right? And uh, so that's, I think, is the, the advantage. And also, and I think it's very reproducible, right? And precise. And we are now actually exploring this one for many applications. But today, actually, many will talk about how we can couple this uh, robotic system with uh, those genome scale engineering tools, right, to engineer the microorganisms uh, very quickly for metabolic engineering applications. So the traditional approach for metabolic engineering actually is a rational design approach. Basically, is to apply system biology tools to analyze the uh, system, right, you know, using proteomics, uh, you know, trans uh, transcriptomics, uh, uh, RNA seq, and a lot of tools, right and try to identify those rate-limiting steps, and then you, you know, uh, use genetic engineering tools to either knock out genes or overexpress genes. And this, of course, is a very slow process because you know, it's a highly interconnected network, right? The rate-limiting step, rate, rate step at one condition may be actually different from others, and also the rate limiting step is always changing. So that's why we kind of inspired by the director of protein evolution, we actually decided to you know, develop those uh, genome scale engineering tools so that we can perturb the whole genome, right? You know, uh, uh, um, and then actually uh, we'll use the, you know, the library screening approach to identify improved variants. And of course, after we get the mutants, we always want to study why, right? We are not giving up the science, right? We also want to study, really try to, in the end, you know, uh, obtain those kind of design principles that are more generally applicable. So in the past uh, uh, few years, you know, all these are recent work, and it's all published basically in the two year, past two years, right? So basically, why is really we uh, used RNA interference machinery, right, to perturb gene expression on genome scale, we call the RIDGE method. Another one is based on the CRISPR uh, uh, tool, we call it CRISPR-8, and more, another one is on the review, as also actually it's a, a method based on CRISPR. And then another one is based on the, also CRISPR, but you know, we can do it uh, you know, uh, 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 very precisely on a genome. So for the first approach, we actually, uh, basically, what we did is to reconstitute the RNA interference machinery, which only consists of two genes. So it's very simple. We just overexpress these two genes, you know, uh, integrate those two genes in the yeast chromosome. And then we actually isolate the genomic DNA from the yeast and then create a, a library uh, uh, containing those RNA interference cassettes, right? It's basically, you produce the double-stranded RNA. And then actually, this will be processed by the RNA interference machinery to create those RNA interference cassettes. And that will perturb the gene expression, right? Basically, knock down all the gene uh, expression in the cell. And then we actually put the library on this uh, uh, the plate library on the petri dish plate and then try to identify you know, improved uh, variants. And we can uh, you know, do it irreversibly. So, but when we started this work that's a few years ago, we don't know, you know what's the coverage, right? whether we really can knock, out, uh, all, knock down all the genes or not, right? And that was, of course, uh, done before the development of CRISPR, right? So, um, we actually you know, randomly pick, you know, uh, like, uh, uh, no, actually, we did some calculation. We know that you know, we need to screen more than 400,000 in order to have uh, you know, full coverage, more or less full coverage. And then we also randomly picked the 50 clones from the library, and we found that uh, indeed uh, you know, those RNA interference cassettes can target uh, almost uh, any gene you know, in the chromosome, except the one, you know, but this is also a short chromosome. So <clears throat> and then our sample size is relatively small. So then we did a proof of concept study, and we just picked a temperature sensitive mutation. With this mutation, the yeast actually cannot grow at 37. And then we tried to find the suppressor genes, right, to make the you know, yeast grow at a high temperature again. So that's a very simple readout, right? And what we found that indeed we can identify two known suppressors that are already been reported in literature, but in addition, we identified three novel you know, targets, right? So that actually is very encouraging. That shows that this method indeed worked. And then we applied this method to improve the uh, uh, industry important phenotype, which is the acidic acid tolerance. And we identified a few targeted genes. Uh, once they are knocked down, they can actually improve the tolerance. And uh, 
uh, and I don't go to the details because you know we already published and we actually found that those mutations are synergistic. And if you analyze those uh, you know uh, uh, mutations individually, you don't see too much improvement. But when you combine it together, you will see you know more dramatic uh, improvement. And of course, we accumulate those uh, mutations through multiple runs, right? And then we actually you know. Uh, uh, used this uh, uh, IBAR fab, I just mentioned the robotic system, right? So we developed the, you know, this uh, fully automated workflow, which actually uh, consists of the isol grow, grow, uh, growing the cells, right? And also isolation of the uh, cDNA in this case, because we want to overexpress those genes as well, in addition to you know, knock down those genes. So we basically created two libraries. And then we transform the yeast competent cells to create the two libraries and then do the screening. And then once we find the improved one, uh, we isolate them. And then actually, uh, we actually do the second round of uh, 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 direct evolution. And we actually automate the whole workflow, which can be done in about two weeks. Right? And but this one requires a minimal kind of human intervention, right? So essentially, you don't need to do you know, isolation of a plasmid or, or in the genomic DNA. You know? And, and uh, the reason we can do it iteratively because we also take advantage of the CRISPR system. We can integrate those uh, you know, uh, beneficial cassettes into the, uh, the delta sequence on the chromosome iteratively. And we show that uh, through several runs, you know, we can dramatically improve the tolerance of the yeast towards acetic acid. Right? So that's actually <clears throat> is encouraging. And we sequenced the, those evolved strands. We found that they all share you know, many mutations, right? same mutation, but still, there are 41 you know, mutations. So it's still very hard to really identify what is really responsible for the improved you know, tolerance. And then in the second approach, we actually uh, uh, developed a, a kind of an orthogonal a CRISPR system. So we basically find the three you know, uh, Cas9 proteins that they can work uh, in, uh, independently in the same cell, right? Because they use uh, you know, uh, uh, different uh, PAM sequence, right? And we fused the, the inactive Cas9 with the activation domain, and another Cas9 with the repression domain, and another one is active, right? So then we basically can do overexpression, downregulation, or knockout for any given gene, right, in the, uh, in the uh, chromosome. And then we actually you know, uh, create a library of uh, you know, the, uh, those genetic manipulations right, for uh, targeted genes. And then we can also screen this library to identify the improved uh, variants. And as a proof of concept study, we picked the uh, beta carotene production pathway. You know, we identified the genes that are involved in the synthesis of this compound. And uh, we actually you know, applied this uh, CRISPR aid uh, tool right, to basically do kind of the uh, 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 knockout, uh, overexpression, knockdown for those genes. And then we identify the best uh, in the mutant, uh, uh, which indeed actually shows you know, uh, 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 the deletion of this gene, uh, overexpression of this gene, and knockdown of this gene. So clearly there's a synergistic uh, you know, uh, effect right, of those genetic manipulations. And in addition, we apply this same tool to improve the production of uh, cellulase. So in this case, we identify those uh, genes that are involved in protein synthesis, right? Those genes in the ER, Golgi, and then we can also improve the protein you know, uh, synthesis, right? And we found that the best one also requires uh, synergistic uh, kind of uh, genetic manipulations, right? So both actually show that it's the importance of uh, you know, this combinatorial approach. And then later, we actually also in, uh, extended this uh, approach to the genome scale, not just uh, a, f a dozens of genes. We want to target all the 6,000 genes right, in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisia. So I will explain you know, how we create a library in the next, uh, uh, um, next few slides, not this slide. And then we created this library. We can do basically uh, all the genetic manipulations in this organism. And uh, uh, we used this uh, uh, approach basically, and also coupled uh, with the uh, in vivo sensor that actually will respond to the s adenosyl methionine, right? And we found that, uh, you know, this, of course, is, uh, you know, reporter gene. Once the SAM bind, you know, the actual reporter will be turned on, and also it's dependent on the uh, SAM concentration. So we basically can have an in vivo biosensor that can tell us the concentration of SAM. And we actually uh, used this uh, you know, comprehensive library coupled with in vivo sensor. We identify you know, uh, gene uh, targets that actually can improve the production of uh, uh, SAM. 
And then we also actually uh, characterize those uh, mutations. And of course, I don't go into the details. Actually, we know all the exact targets, right? And many of them actually still hard to explain why they actually improve the same production. But nonetheless, we also you know, uh, transfer those mutations uh, to uh, the industrial strain. Because we did all the studies in the laboratory strain, and we found that they also work the, in the industrial strain as well. You know? So that's good, because that means that we can identify those targets, and, the, and then they actually are more or less uh, you know, uh, uh, general right, for other organisms. And now, as I said, I will explain how we created this library. Right? So this library creation is based on the, basically the uh, CRISPR system. And what we did is that we synthesized uh, uh, um, oligo of about 120 uh, BP, right? And this, uh, in this oligo actually contains the homology arm and also the guide RNA. And, uh, and then what we did is that you know, we synthesized those uh, uh, oligos on a microarray. So then for each of the 6,000 genes, we uh, uh, designed the six, four in the guide RNA because we want to make sure that the, it definitely can work, right? So for, we, there's a redundancy there. And then we synthesized more than 24,000 you know, those oligos and ta uh, that target basically all the 6,000 genes. And then we cloned the, these uh, oligos into the plasmid that containing the Cas9. And then we actually transformed them into the uh, uh, yeast. And then you know, the guide RNA, of course, will bring the Cas9 to the right place and cut it. And then it will, um, uh, through homotopy recombination, the deletion actually will be introduced into the chromosome, right? So then we can create a library of uh, you know the gene knockout uh, yeast basically, and then we can use the you know, next generation sequencing to identify the strands that shows the improved phenotype, right? But of course, this phenotype has to be linked to cell growth because we are doing kind of enrichment. But nonetheless, we can basically identify the ones that really you know, show the uh, better you know, phenotype. And of course, when we develop that method, we also want to you know, do some quality control. We want to make sure the knockout is efficient, you know, it's no bias. So we analyzed uh, uh, those uh, uh, you know, knockout cassettes and found that, uh, yeah, on average, the editing efficiency is pretty high. And also, you, know, you can not edit immediately. It's more like even within 20 uh, nucleotide, uh, uh, that range, they all can uh, uh, have a high efficiency. But more importantly, I think, is that we did a proof of concept study. So in the presence of this cannabinoid, the E statue will be killed, because that's a drug, right? But if uh, the transporter <clears throat> is knocked out, and then actually the yeast, of course, you know, cannot get this, the, the, the drug cannot enter the cell anymore, right? So then the cell can survive. So this is a very simple readout. Then what we did is that we transform this library you know, of uh, uh, knockout cassettes into yeast. And then we uh, basically added the cannabinoid, and we found the yeast that can survive. And then we sequenced the plasmid. And indeed, we found that all the uh, plasmid that survived contain this uh, uh, knockout, the guide RNA that target, you know, this can can one gene, right? So that's actually very encouraging. That means that the, out of six thousand genes, we can exactly pinpoint uh, the target, right? And then we actually used this method to improve, you know, this, uh, uh, two Im important industry important phenotype, the acetic acid tolerance and furfural. Those are the inhibitors, you know, in the fermentation, right? So that's why we are interested in that. And then we actually identify the, you know, the improved targets, right? And sometimes it can improve the tolerance. And then once again, we will use direct evolution approach. We actually you know, did several runs. We just accumulate those you know, beneficial targets, right? And through several runs, we can uh, basically you know, dramatically improve the tolerance towards both you know, for, uh, inhibitors. But what distinguishes this method from other you know, kind of uh, genome-wide screening method based on CRISPR is that uh, uh, it's the ability to basically uh, uh, not uh, remove a uh, single nucleotide on the chromosome, right? And the reason we can do it is, you know, I already showed the, the method, right? It's through whole marks of nation, we can remove uh, like a, a few nucleotides, but also we can actually just uh, replace a nucleotide, right? So that is actually basically enables to do in vivo mutagenesis. We are all very familiar with in vitro mutagenesis, basically use uh, uh, you know, uh, PCR to do the side derivative mutagenesis. But now, you know, we can, basically uh, alter the protein sequence in the chromosome, right? And I think that is actually important because if you study some you know, protein functions uh, uh, that are interact with, uh, you know, the protein may interact with other things, right? So now you can uh, study the, basically the in vivo function of the protein. Uh, and then you know, as a proof of concept, we actually choose the 
like a, a, a protein that is known to improve the fulfill tolerance that we identified. And then we actually choose this particular region, you know, the 29 amino acid, and then we change every residue to you know other 19 you know amino acids right and then we do the you know screening and we identify those uh, exact mutations that can actually really show the improvement right so that's actually you know it's, it's a one way you know that I just mentioned you really can now study the protein function in vivo but of course this is only for yeast right and I, and I you know this system a tool cannot work in a mammalian cell yet you know because the mammalian cells you know doesn't have a high homologous recognition because this is based on homologous recognition and I think more recently, we're actually very fortunate to get a, a you know, big DOE grant. So with this new grant, we really try to further develop you know, the biofoundry I just mentioned, right? So in this biofoundry, we want to basically you know, develop a new capability for the design, build, test, and learn cycle. And uh, we want to uh, you know, apply system biology tools to really understand what constraints the production of the chemicals, right, in uh, using cells. And also, we want to develop uh, tools you know, to design new pathways for the synthesis of uh, new compounds. And, but more importantly, it's really it's, uh, this component, right? We want to develop this automated uh, cell engineering platform I just mentioned, not just for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but also for other organisms. So that's why we have to develop a lot of capabilities, you know, uh, tools right here. And then in addition, we want to develop you know, the, uh, the high throughput screening or selection method. So we want to develop biosensors or mass spec-based approaches, right? And so then also we want to apply this uh, you know, uh, robotic system or the biofoundry for the metabolic engineering of uh, a wide variety of organisms, as I've shown here, for production of uh, different uh, you know, uh, compounds, right? uh, organic acid, uh, you know, lipids-based chemicals, or alcohols. So in summary, what I show today is really that you know, uh, direct evolution is a very powerful tool right? for engineering of biological systems uh, at different scales. And also, I showed you know, the development of a few direct evolution tools, some for protein engineering, some for pathway engineering, and also some for genome engineering. And I think my current effort is mostly focused on genome engineering, because I think uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, things that we can do in that area, particularly thanks to the development of the CRISPR tool and also you know, those uh, robotic uh, systems. So, in, so finally, I would like to thank the students who did the most. Of, well, I don't show them, but uh, uh, I have a level in Singapore as well. I mean, they are doing different things. And I also you know, I have funding agency from various uh, funding, uh, uh, federal funding agencies in the US, and also you know, some funding from you know, companies as well. So thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Really, really wonderful talk. Now, I'm just wondering, so when you do uh, unbiased uh, 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 system scale screening for certain functions, mm -hmm. certain pathways. So once you have the end result, if you go back, would you allow, would this kind of thing allow us to understand more how this system is, uh, nature how designs this system, understand the logics of mm -hmm. the natural design for the sake of Scientific understanding. Yeah, exactly. Of, That's exactly what we're focused on. That's what I'm saying. For protein engineering, of course, most people want to you know, determine the structure, do detailed calculation, right? But in many cases, we still don't know the exact mechanism, mainly because many of the mutations we found are still far away from the active site. So it's still sometimes very hard to rationalize. And then for the like a cell engineering, then also we apply the, all the you know, omics tools, you imagine, right? But nonetheless, it's still very hard to um, understand. But nonetheless, we uh, haven't given up. That's why in the DOE Center grant, I assembled a team. We have a, a really hardcore you know, system biologist you know, uh, really study you know, the, the system right, in details. And we basically want to use the integrated omics tools. We actually use the same organism, but we will uh, use uh, you know, uh, the metabolic flux analysis, uh, the RNA-seq, uh, uh, and then proteomics, uh, and also computational modeling. So basically, whatever the tools available, we really want to combine them, really try to understand the, the mechanism. And as I said, our goal is really, in the end, is to obtain those uh, design principles that are more generally applicable, right? We're not just, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so that with... Uh that naturally would be generating a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. So uh, would that be possible to uh, uh, introduce new like AI-based sort of methods? That's a very good question. That's exactly what we're doing. That's what we're doing that actually is uh, 
because we have the robotic system, right? And then what we are doing is actually also apply the machine learning algorithms, because I have two collaborators all from computer science. So basically they analyze the data and then they will decide the next round of uh, improvement, right? So I showed the, uh, in, in one case, I haven't published that paper yet. So we basically use the robotic system coupled with uh, you know, machine learning to optimize the pathway very quickly. So by using that approach, we can significantly reduce the number of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, mutants that need to be screened. And then we're also now applying for the uh, genome scale engineering as well. And I think that's the key advantage of the robotic uh, integrated uh, automated robot system. Because you can generate a lot of data, as you point out, right? And then if you also couple with the machine learning, then they can analyze data, then they can actually really you know, uh, uh, accelerate the search, essentially. Yeah, exactly. That's a very Thanks. good question. Thank you for the talk. And I want to ask about the single nucleotide base editing. Yeah. And what's the advantage of your system compared to like David Liu's system where they use the deaminases? It's a what? So what's your the advantage what's with what? The advantage compared to the system that's developed by David Liu in Oh the base editor. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about base editor. Uh, our advantage of course we can target all the six thousand genes uh, uh, um, in a high throughput manner, right? Because uh, uh, you know we can just you know design those oligos I just mentioned, right? We can synthesize them on the microarray and then do it. And the base editor, I think, it's mainly used uh, in mammalian cells. I don't know whether they tried uh, in in Saccharomyces cerevisiae yet. And also, the efficiency is definitely not as high as uh, the the method I just mentioned. But of course, after we published that paper, as you noticed, uh, there are two more. Uh, Papers are all very similar, <laughs> right? And basically, yeah, one is from George Church's group, one is uh, from a group at the Stanford. They all publish in Nature Biotech. It's just uh, one is the same issue. One is that's like a few weeks later. So it's uh, all a very similar idea. You know? In addition to yeast, what other organisms that can be potentially to be, you know, employed or, or this your, your method, this uh -huh. high throughput genome editing method can yeah. be employed to? Uh, right now, of course, in the DOE Center grant, we try to um, extend uh, all the tools we developed for Saccharomyces cerevisia to those non-model yeasts, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, the Isachenkia, Orientalis, or Rhodosrelia. Basically, we have to develop the CRISPR system for them first and then try to you know, extend them to a genome scale. But then we're also actually uh, 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 working with other uh, groups and uh, actually uh, you know, for E. coli, I think that should be doable. But for the uh, mammalian cells, I think it's still challenging. Cause uh, just how the about the multicellular organisms like plants or crops? Uh, yeah, plants, we are thinking about that. You know, we are doing, the, but probably not a genome scale, but at least, you know, uh, at the single gene knockout or, you know, modification level, right? But as I mentioned, I think I think uh, Minjie just mentioned that if we can really, you know, couple with the machine learning kind of tools, we can really find uh, narrow the search. We don't need to really create a big library because what do we demonstrate in the pathway engineering? We can screen just a couple hundred. We already can significantly improve the you know phenotype, right? Because it's uh, you you basically learned from the you know each round. Uh, you know, the screening, right? And then you can actually design the library based on that data. Then you can, can make it uh, basically faster and faster, you know? So I, I think, uh, you know, you don't need to really create a huge library. Please join me to give another round of big applause to okay. Professor Thanks. Ra. Thanks.